and uh, developers. We had Paula Stembleicher, Paula Stembleicher, who bought the Epaphroditus Ransom Farm, I love this, for $12,000 in gold, um, paid in gold. He came, uh, he led a group of people from the, uh, from the Netherlands in 1850, and we had developers like David Merrill. Sharon also talked about the Pioneer Cemetery, which started in 1833, and of course, the Union School, which was located it was originally opened in 1859 on the corner of Vine and Westnich. The growth and density in Vine, I have a few reasons that I have here, and Sharon touched on these and talked about these last week. Location, 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 location. When you think of Vine and its proximity to the downtown area, that obviously aided its growth. Also, the inability to travel up hills, what do I mean by that? Someone described Kalamazoo to me one time as a salad bowl. And the downtown area is sort of at the base of the salad bowl, and you have all these hills that line Kalamazoo, which have really surprised people that come to visit me who are not used to Kalamazoo. They don't expect it to be so hilly. So for the first 50, 60, 70 years of Kalamazoo's development, there's basically in the Vine, Northside, Stewart, downtown area because they weren't able to get up the hills. Now the streetcars came in 1884, but as Sharon pointed out last week, they were originally pulled by horses. They weren't electrified until 1893. So obviously what that means, people are living in what we now know as the central downtown area, which obviously had an impact on the growth and the density in the Vine area. Sharon also talked about the impact of the nearby institutions, the Michigan Asylum for the Insane, which opened up in 1859. Um, you know, we could probably go through the census or the city directories to see where the people who lived in the Vine neighborhood worked at. I'm sure that there were some that worked at the insane asylum. Pat is going, yes, yeah, so I feel I'm on the right track here, so that's really good. Um, and Western State Normal School. We already talked about the impact that that school had on the development in the Vine neighborhood. There's always been this symbiotic relationship between the Vine neighborhood and Western. When the school opened up in 1903, um, they had this agreement between Western and the school system so that Western would be able to use the public school buildings. So while they were constructing the East Hall, in 19, which opened up in 1905, the first summer session in 1904 was held at Kalamazoo High School and Vine Elementary School in the Vine neighborhood. So see, there was this real relationship between the two. And obviously, Sharon was able to show, too, the impact that the opening of Western had on the Vine neighborhood because the first dorm was built at Western not until 1938, okay? So for over 30 years, students lived primarily in the Vine neighborhood. And also the impact on the growth and density in the Vine neighborhood, the growth in Kalamazoo's population. Between 1880 and 1900, the population doubled. 1900, the population was 25,000, which doesn't seem much, but uh, it had doubled in 20 years. Now the last statistic, if you can see it, it's at the bottom of the screen, is really something. Between 1900 and 1910, the population of Kalamazoo increased by 62%. One of the main reasons they give is because of the growth of the paper industry. Well, why do I throw out that statistic? Well, they had to live somewhere, okay? So all of these factors combined together to aid in the growth of the Vine neighborhood. Now one of the things that Sharon talked about last week too, when you talk about density in the Vine neighborhood, not only the main streets that are in the neighborhood, but also those small courts or places. Now Sharon, you said 12, didn't you? 13, 12, 13. 12, 13. I don't know where I got this number. Somewhere I read that said 30. I, I don't know, I've never seen that. Well, there are some that are gone now. Okay. Like Gladys Court, um, uh, Pearl Court, um, Normal View Court, where the $50 house was. Yeah. Okay, so maybe there were at one time over 30 of these in the neighborhood. But, you know, you have Westnich Court, you have Vine Place, and one of my favorite ones is Normal Court that is still there. And those probably were as a result of the people living here that decided to develop and build houses because of what? Western, the demand of the population, you know, the growth of the population, whatever. But that's one thing that Vine has, too, that I think make them unique. I don't think you'll see that in other neighborhoods. Sharon talked about this house. We're going to start off with talking about Greek Revival because that's really the first 
recognizable architectural style that we see in the neighborhood. For those of you that were not at the program Thursday evening, uh, but have been on my tours, you may recognize this house. If you have not, this is the Justice Burdick home, which from what we can feel is probably the oldest house in Kalamazoo, built in 1838 by Justice Burdick. It was not originally on this site. I won't go into the details because Sharon talked about it last week, but ever so briefly, the house was originally built on Michigan Avenue, uh, closer to Exchange Place, where the building is for Kalamazoo communities and schools. It was a uh, title bond mortgage. Uh, building. It sat on top of a hill, so there was a little more height there than what there exists now. It was moved in the 1850s to where the Co-America Bank building is today, and then in 1881 was moved to this uh, area on the corner of Vine and Westnich. Greek Revival. Now again, when I'm saying this this evening, keep in mind, when I give an architectural style, I'm going to give a little date range, okay? But as Sharon pointed out last week, remember when I say to you, this style of architecture was popular between this day and this day. Because for example, Greek Revival could be anywhere from 1830 to maybe 1860. Now that doesn't mean there weren't Greek Revivals in Michigan before 1830. And this doesn't mean that although I haven't seen any Greek Revivals after 1860, it doesn't mean that they didn't build them after that date. So keep that in mind when I'm giving you these dates. That just gives you a general date range. So Greek Revival architecture was really the first big architecture in Michigan. Uh, they was popular early on out east. It was a style of architecture that was popularized and it became very prevalent in the United States at this time because we thought of ourselves as an extension of Greek democracy. Um, we adopted so many things that were Greek, whether it be clothing, whether it be names, uh, when you look at some of the cities in Michigan, Athens, Michigan, Ionia, Michigan, Ypsilanti, Michigan, that was named after a Greek general, you know, we really saw ourselves as an extension of Greece. And so obviously, we also um, adopted architecture. And I better watch what I say because Nelson's sitting right here in the front. If that's not intimidation, I don't know what it is to have Sharon, Sharon Fryer over there, Nelson Nave over there. Anyway, what do we see? Now, the Justice Burdick House is a very large house, there's no question about that. Uh, but Justice Burdick was a very well-off individual. Um, and what we see in this house, this house, and the slide is a little more elongated than what it really should be. Um, this could be described as a temple-shaped house. Now what I want you to do is take that porch off, because when did you say that porch was built, Sharon? Uh, when the house arrived in 1881. Okay, 1881. So take the, porch, take the porch off, and that was the basic size of the house. The windows, the, um, are about the, the shape of what you would see in a Greek Revival. And you can see that the roof is slightly hipped. Um, there's a little bit of a pitch, pitch to it. Uh, and it is really a classic Greek Revival. One of the things that you also see in this house is, and I don't know if I have it. Yes, I do. Um, look at the front porch, the doorway. That is a real Greek Revival element because one of the things you see in Greek Revival is um, the doorway that has side lights on the side. Um, we're going to see in some other Greek revivals some of the other characteristics, but we have the Justice Burdick House. This is another Greek revival that Sharon showed last week. This is the Daniel Jacobs House. This is on Oak Street, built in 1849 with some alterations in 1854. Now this is an L-shaped Greek revival. This is the kind of house that you would see a lot out on the farm. Uh, and for example, if you go on Oakland Drive, the Andrew Jackson Stevens home, that is an L-shaped Greek revival. If you go up and down M43 and some of other our roads, M89, whatever, you'll see the Greek revival farmhouse. One of the characteristics in a Greek revival home is that very wide cornice up at the top. And one of the things that this Greek revival has is what is, re what is referred to as a returning cornice. Now please bear with me. We do have a professional architect here. I am not a professional architect. I don't have all the professional lingo. But a returning cornice, if you follow the cornice up at the top, see how it starts up at the top, goes down, and then returns. That's my unofficial, uneducated way of describing a returning cornice. The other thing you're going to see on the cornice is how wide it is. Okay? It's not decorated in any way. We're going to see that difference there when we look at Italianates. This has got a bay window on the front. 
The windows, the size of the windows are very familiar, very, very much the same as what you saw with the Justice Burdick House over on uh, Vine Street. This is another Greek revival that Sharon gave me the address for on McCourty. Now see, you have the other, the very wide cornice, the gable roof. Again, an unofficial way of describing a gable is how the roof comes into a triangle. I know, totally unprofessional, but it works, okay? But you see how wide the cornice is and the return of the cornice. Uh, so this is a little, little Greek revival. And it's interesting about this house when you walk down the street, how far the setback is. 